Good afternoon, everybody, and happy hump day. We are two days away from the good weekend, and I can see it coming. We're going to talk about a little bit of our apportionment today, post SB 899 and all the changes we've seen. Um, when SB 899 came down on April 19th of 2004, I immediately uh, began teaching us about the subject. And when I would get to apportionment, I, uh, I uh, spoke highly of Labor Code Section 4663 and the new 4664 and how uh, they, they strengthen the opportunity for the defense to uh, get apportionment uh, much stronger than the, than the old law much more advantageous to the defense. And I told my friends and neighbors that, you know what, this is as good as it's going to get. Enjoy it while it's here, because our friends at the California Applicants Attorneys Association and their associates are going to start whittling away at this thing as quickly as possible and make that pendulum start swinging back the other way. I was absolutely wrong. This pendulum has continued to swing upwards in our, in, on, on our side, on the defense side, uh, case law. Uh, whether it be at the, WC, at the WCJ level, the WCAB level, or the Court of Appeal level, has, for the most part, come down on the part of the defense. So life is life is great in that regard. So what's apportionment about? Obviously, it's about paying for only for your slice of the pie. And I like pumpkin pie, so there we go. How, or how not to be hit by the entire pie. What's apportionment? Well... The employer is responsible only for that portion of PD caused by the industrial injury. That's almost verbatim what Labor Code Section 4664B says. Apportionment, as most of you should know, applies only to permanent disability. It does not, apport, it does not apply to take TD, medical treatment, VR, vouchers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Plenty of case law on that score. Similarly, death benefits um, are not apportioned to non-industrial factors. There's no support for that in the labor code, and there uh, is case law that says it's simply not humanitarian, which seems fair enough. I can't, despite being a dad in the world defendant, I, I don't have a big difficulty with that. So what are we talking about today? We're going to be talking exclusively about labor code section 4663 and 4664 and um, the resulting case law. We have no new regulations that have apply to 4663 or 4664, with the exception of the permanent disability rating schedule, um, but that uh, uh, really does not deal with apportionment in any significant way, but lots and lots of case law. Here's what we're going to be dealing with, Labor Code Section 4663. Now, now they see it, now you don't. Uh, what does it actually say? Permanent disability shall be based on, Caucasian, on causation. Um, every report to be admissible shall address the issue of causation, it must include an apportionment determination. The doctor must provide an approximate percentage of that which is AOE-COE and an approximate percentage of that which is not AOE-COE or as a result of another AOE-COE injury. If the physician is unable to do so, he or she shall state specific reasons why they can't make that determination and then shall consult with somebody who's smarter, well, consult with another physician who can help in that regard, something we don't see very often, something we'll discuss later on. The good news, it's pretty much all good news. And that started um, effective April 19th of 2005, exactly one year to the date of the passage of SBA 99. The Escobedo decision, an en banc decision, meaning it's citable and it's the law, unless something changes and nothing has changed, with the WCIB's way of saying happy birthday and defendants, you get all the gifts. Here's the fact pattern. There was a bilateral knee injury. There was a specific to the left knee, and almost immediately thereafter, there were compensable consequences to the right side. The applicant had never had pre-injury knee treatment, prior arthritis, but asymptomatic, no work restrictions, no need for treatment whatsoever. The defense QME, Dr. Avadia, nevertheless, apportioned 50-50, 50 to uh, the work injury, 50% to pre-existing um, asymptomatic conditions. He said this, there was a medically reasonable basis for apportionment given the trivial nature of the initial injury and the almost immediate onset of right knee symptoms. That's it, that's the world standard, that's everything he said. If you're looking for medical citations, sites to medical works, to studies, et cetera, et cetera, you're not going to find anything. This is, the, this is what the doctor said, 
of a 13-year-old who probably could have done just as good a job explaining or justifying a 50-50 split in apportionment. And what did they go to directly? Well, to Labor Code Section 4663, apportionment of permanent disability shall be based on causation. The holding, which factors can we apportion to? Well, we can apportion here in this particular case. We can also apportion to disability that would have been apportioned prior to SB 899, which those of you who were doing workers' compensation prior to April 1999 know that that was uh, uh, about as common as hen's teeth. Very rarely did you get apportionment. And we can apportion to pathology, asymptomatic prior conditions, which is exactly what Mrs. Escobedo had in this particular situation. Remember, she didn't have any problems. She never received prior treatment. She never was placed, placed on work restrictions. Nevertheless, we're apportioning 50% uh, apportioning to the non-industrial factors. Prophylactic work preclusions, something that would have probably been used more if we were apportioning uh, to uh, um, the 1997 permanent disability rating schedule. For those of you who are not familiar with the 1997 PDRS, just be thankful. For those of you who do remember it, I'm sorry that you're old like me. Even if a report causes, uh, a report addresses causation of PD and makes the uh, apportionment determination by finding the quote unquote approximate percentage of industrial and non-industrial uh, PD, the report can't be used unless it is substantial evidence. Substantial evidence is the rule. Um, if the judge finds that something's not substantial evidence, any kind of evidence on any issue, um, he or she cannot rely on them. What exactly is substantial evidence? Well. Is it really a swag? For those of you who have been around a while, you might remember swag. It's a scientific wild ass guess. Now, why am I using this dicey language in a mixed audience? Because I didn't come up with it. Take a look at your labor code, 2005, page 1390. Um, some goofy um, editor snuck this in, scientific wild ass guess. See, for example, labor code section 4663. That 4663 is the statute we just looked at, took a look at, where it says the doctors provide the quote unquote approximate percentage of PD that's industrial and the quote unquote approximate percentage that is non industrial. So um, apparently, this editor thought that um, it, was, it was merely guesswork for 4663 apportionment and evidence based medicine. Nevertheless, despite what this editor's position was, that is not the answer. Um, uh, substantial evidence is reliance on a reasonable medical probability. If the doctor can state that the record, that the uh, opinion that he or she is providing is based on a reasonable medical probability, that evidence is not substantial and therefore cannot be realized, relied upon by the judge. Now, so what, what does the judge going to be relying on? Well, the reasoning behind the doctor's opinion. The doctor can't just say, I'm going to split the baby 50-50 because I'm an AME and that's what I do. No, the doctor has to provide an explanation of the how and why uh, that he, he or she achieved to be at 50% or whatever the number is, apportionment. Remember what Dr. Avadia said. Well, I'll repeat that. There is a medically reasonable basis for the uh, apportionment given the trivial nature of the initial injury and the almost immediate onset of right knee symptoms on the other side. Again, that's all the doctor said. That's the gold standard. Um, it did the trick in an en banc decision to support apportionment. Uh, if we do it thus, if we do it right, we don't need a whole heck of a lot from the doctors to support our apportionment determination. Again, they have to do it right, and we're going to go over what is needed to make it right uh, over the next hour. Nice quote. I love this. The language in Labor Code Section 4663 stating apportionment may be based on, quote, factors both before and subsequent to the industrial injury does not limit what non-industrial factors may be considered. Thus, this language appears to require apportionment, that require apportionment based on any, 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 any other non-industrial factor, either pre or post injury. Perhaps a uh, word just jumped out at you as I was reading that, and I certainly hope it was any. That any underlined in italics was actually in the original uh, language of the en banc decision of Escobedo. I can't think of any other time I've seen an en banc decision that has had underlining and, uh, and, and italics of, of a word. I think the WCAB was certainly trying to tell somebody uh, that is our friends at the CAW, at CAW that, uh, apportion, that apportionment was, uh, was uh, starting to become a real factor in workers' compensation. 
how often doctors get Escobedo wrong? All the time. You show me 100 reports in which the doctor applies Escobedo or, pertain, or claims to um, uh, apply Escobedo, and I'll show you at least 20 reports that do it incorrectly. Oftentimes, the doctors will say, there is no apportionment per Escobedo because the applicant was, a, um, was the asymptomatic prior to the industrial injury. That is exactly wrong. That is exactly the opposite of what Escobedo stands for. First, any, so any time you see a doctor making that claim that he's relying, he or she is relying on Escobedo, please take a look at the language in there and see whether that is accurate. And um, you can remind the doctor either through supplemental or deposition that what the true ruling was in Escobedo and how it may apply to your particular case. So let's discuss Benson, shall we? An old case, but um, new wrinkles. And no, not this Benson. If you, if you do recognize this guy, you probably also remember the 1997 schedule and you are old like me. I'm 57 and I definitely remember who this Benson was. And no, it's not this Benson. No, it's this Benson. Benson case, another en banc decision that came down 10 years ago, but it's very important for our consideration and um, uh, that we have some new insights into it that I think are important to, to go over. Here's the fact pattern. There was a neck injury of 62%, and the doctor split it up 50-50, 50% to a continuous trauma, 50% to a specific injury. And the two injuries became PMS, PNS or MMI at the same time. And the question became, what does the applicant get? Does he get one single 62% award, or does he get two 31% awards? This is important because two 30, one, a 31% award is worth about 24,600, 24, or a total of 49,000, whereas 62% was worth 67,000. Clearly, there's, we want the two single awards. If, it, if the one in the two single awards isn't obvious to you, imagine a 100% award split up 50-50. Clearly, there's going to be a hundred, hundreds of thousands of dollars difference between those two different type of awards. Well, in, in Benson, it was decided that you split up the injuries. And that's something that we want to always look for in any of our cases when there's two or more injuries. Sometimes we want to invite applicants' counsel to file a specific when we've got a CT, or a CT when we've got a specific, or another specific when we've got a specific. This can work to our advantage. So in this particular case, it saved almost $18,000. And the logic utilized by uh, the court in this case, or the WCAB in this case, was that um, the law that had been used to um, argue that the applicant should get the total 62% well, was Labor Code Section 4750, and it had been taken out um, of the Labor Code by SB 899. The, uh, the WCAB took a look at uh, Labor Code Section 4663 and read it, the employer shall only be liable for the percentage of the PD directly caused by the injury, shall be only responsible for the percentage of permanent disability caused by the injury. Well, how many the injuries are we, do we have? Well, we have the CT, 31 cents. 31%, $24,000, and the specific, $24,600. Um, that, that was the logic, and thank goodness it was. Here's a potential loophole, which most of you should be familiar with. This is what the WCAB said. There may be limited circumstances where the evaluating physicians cannot parcel out with to a re reasonable medical probability, remember those are the magic words for substantial evidence, the approximate percentage to which each successive injury causally contributed to the employee's overall PD. Under these circumstances, a combined award may still be justified. Um, inextricably interlinked, I think, is the phrase that the doctors like to use when they're then sending us in a bad way. Still may be justified, not mandatory. I don't buy it. What about Labor Code Section 4663, which says there shall be an apportionment determination, and if the physician is unable to make that apportionment determination, if the doctor says, for example, inextricably interlinked, I can't split up the CT in the specific or the two specific or whatever may be the case, they're supposed to explain why, and then, again, they're supposed to consult with somebody who's smarter with them, another physician uh, who the employee is authorized to seek treatment or evaluation under the labor code. We didn't, so if your doctor is suddenly stupid, they're absolutely certain to a reasonable medical probability and can provide you with substantial evidence on causation, AOE, COE, medical treatment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But when it comes to apportionment, no idea, too speculative, inextricably interlinked, 
there is a quack, quack, quack. There is a defense answer. It's Labor Code Section 5701. 5701 provides that the WCIB might direct an employee claiming compensation to be examined by a regular doctor. So what does that mean? That means when your doctor is providing the inextricably interlinked, I can't possibly do the make the determin apportionment determination is too speculative. You simply file with the WCAB and ask them to assign um, a re quote unquote regular doctor. Regular doctor is the phraseology now. It used to be independent medical examiner or IME. We no longer use that phraseology, but a regular doctor is the same as an IME. So we petitioned the WCAB for the assignment of a regular doctor for the purpose of consulting with the doctor who can't figure out how to apportion and see what the answer is there. I've done this in Southern, Southern Central and Northern California, and in all three situations, Applicants Council has blinked. Uh, apparently, they did not want to make case law, and we were able to split the baby and come up with a reasonable resolution of the cases. Multiple apportionment determinations. What if there are multiple apportionment determinations that conflict with uh, one another, even when there's multiple by the same doctor? Um, the answer is, as long as there's substantial evidence, the, um, the doctor or the judge can uh, take something to uh, can look at the range of evidence. Misery with math. I was never a great math student. Facts, you've got two defendants and two AMEs. One AME says 50% apportionment due to obesity and pre-existing condition. The second AME says 0% apportionment. The holding in this particular case was that neither opinion was entirely convincing. Though apparently there was, they were somewhat substantial and true to a reasonable medical probability, at least according to the doctors, because the judge found that they were va there were valid portions in both reports. Understand that just because the, doctor, the judge finds that a part of the report is not substantial evidence or not true to a reasonable medical probability does not mean that the entire report necessarily is thrown out. So the judge awarded 20% apportionment based on the obesity and pre-existing by splitting the baby on the range of evidence. That is still an option. City of Petu uh, Petaluma, Lind, we have a public safety officer. This is a relatively new case who received numerous blows to the head during canine training. Shortly thereafter, there were severe headaches. Several hours later, one to two days or a month later, lost vision in his left eye, something that did not return. The, the PTP said there was an underlying asymptomatic vascular condition that may have a, that may have contributed to this. The QME said the vaso we because we got the vasospastic condition plus the blow to the head resulted in this what they was calling a stroke in the eye. But the QME admitted, I don't know if the pre existing condition would have resulted in the stroke on its own or if it required the blow. I mean maybe the blow was the camel that broke the that broke or the rather the straw that broke the camel's back. I'm not sure, but nevertheless, blindness may have occurred without the trauma. The QME said, nevertheless, I'm going to a reasonable medical probability um, state that I believe 85% of the pre existing vasospastic, um, um, that the pre existing vasospastic condition resulted in 85% of the PV, and the blow resulted in 15% of it. And this became a big deal because it was stipulated that without apportionment, this case was worth 40%, and with apportionment, it would be worth only 6%. The WCJ said this was not substantial evidence, and the WCAB um, agreed. They said, and I quote, the QME's opinion established that the applicant's pre-existing hyperactivity type personality and his asymptomatic and pre-existing systemic hypertension um, were mere risk factors that predisposed him to having a left eye injury but the actual injury and its resultant disability, that is the blindness, were entirely caused by industrial factors. And it is in support of that, the injured worker actually also claimed that there was case law, it admitted there was case law, law and apportionment that involved degenerative conditions, that is something that was a progressive disease, something we'll go into later, but that this was different because this condition may never have become symptomatic so no apportionment should be allowed. Happily, the District Court of Appeal in a published decision said they are wrong. They said that what is required here is substantial medical evidence, again, are magical words, that the asymptomatic condition was a contributing fact cause of the disability. In short, you look backwards, you go, what you, you say, what is the final amount of permanent disability? Okay, it is whatever your number is, 40%. 
Okay, let's look backwards. Now, what contributed to that? Um, the injury, to the the, the uh, striking of the eye, and well, half of that, so 20%, and the other 20% was due to the underlying condition, so 20%. But we start at the end with the final number of PD and work backward when we do our math. Um, and that's exactly what the DCA, DCA said. We look to the current disability and parcel out its causative sources. In short, the camel plus the straw equaling a bad back, that's not a problem. We can, we can apportion when, even when this, it was the injury um, was a, the uh, injury was a mere straw to the bad back. Lynn has wide, wide, wide potential. And think about this, and I think you'll enjoy that. It has potential for diabetes and apportionment, for cardiovascular problems and apportionment, pulmonary disease, DDD, what's DDD, degenerative disc disease, who's got it? Almost everybody over the age of 35 has it. If you just check out your AMA guides, that, is, that information is in there in Chapter 15, and you can actually cite that because the guides are considered a regulation, not a labor code, but a regulation describing the labor code. So it's it's legal and legitimate for you to cite it. Um, also, macular degeneration, emphysema, and arthritis. And arthritis is the number one cause of disability in the United States. So um, we'll definitely want to be looking at that as a potential contribute, contributor to apportionment in all of our cases, especially with our older, elderly population as us baby boomers grow older. Better news, the Supreme Court rejected cause of writ on this thing. So this is the law of the land. Escobedo, Brody, Yeager, Acme Steel, City of Jackson, lots of great cases out there, all of which, we'd love, which I would love to go over with you, but we will not have time with all of them. And City of Jackson, what does City of Jackson say? It talks about immutable factors, genetics, heredity, personal history, um, and it says that this too can be substantial evidence. The test is not immutability or whether the the factor is an immutable factor. The test is whether there's substantial medical evidence, substantial evidence, there's the word again, to support the apportionment. Family And family genetic discovery is not essential. Research will do the trick. It's possible to take look up studies and find what percentage of, what approximate percentage of the PD is caused by genetic factors and what percentage is not without finding out blood, without performing blood tests to mom and dad and grandma and grandpa. We'll talk more about City of Jackson later if we have time. 100% disabled per Labor Code Section 4662. Labor Code Section 4662 is a provision that provides that you're 100%, do not pass go, do not collect $100, do not look, <clears throat> excuse me, do not look at the AMA guides or the permanent disability rating schedule. If you blind the person, they're 100%. If you take off their hands or they can no longer use their hands, they're 100%. If they have practically total paralysis, that is, they're um, um, in a wheelchair and having problems with their upper extremities, or if they have an injury to the brain resulting in permanent mental incapacity. <laughs> and that is what Hirschberger had in this particular case as a result of a work-related psych problem, which aggravated the underlying non asymptomatic or non AOEC or Parkinson's, they became 100% under 4662. And the question here, here was, is there apportionment? And this is the bad news. If somebody becomes 100% um, under Labor Code Section 4662, there is no apportionment whatsoever. So even if the Parkinson's disease had contributed 99% of this 100% peak firm total condition, and the psych, the AOEC, OE psych had contributed only 1%, we still would have been stuck with the entire 100% award. But remember, this is only in those four scenarios, blind, loss of upper extremities or use of upper extremities, practically total paralysis, that is in a wheelchair, um, with some problems with the upper extremities or an injury to the brain resulting in permanent mental incapacity. Portioning to PD arising out of AOE, COE treatment. In this particular Estrada case, we had a 100% back. There was a two-level fusion, AOE, COE, but then they developed deep vein thrombosis requiring um, a number of surgeries. The AME said one-third of the PD is apportioned to pre-existing pathology, and the question was, is there apportionment? The WCIB unfortunately said no. 
They said the PD arising directly from unsuccessful medical treatment is not apportionable, even if need for medical treatment was necessitated by both industrial and non-industrial factors. Now, we thought that this was an outlier because there were WCAB decisions that had actually gone the other way, uh, WCAB panel decisions. And then we had the Hikita decision, um, a, uh, a district court of appeal, a published case that went ahead and completely agreed with Estrada and says that, no, and that's just, I'm going to skip through this very quickly because you've got the, uh, you've got the idea. They said, the issue whether an employer is responsible for both the medical treatment and disability arising directly from unsuccessful medical intervention without apportionment, the answer is yes. An employee is entitled to compensation for a new or aggravated injury which results from the medical or surgical treatment of the industrial injury, whether the doctor was furnished by the employer, the carrier, or selected by the employee. So um, a lot of trouble here. The, you've got an applicant with a bad back. They need surgery. Um, uh, as a result of half because of AOE COE conditions, half of it um, um, because of non AOE COE conditions, the back surgery goes badly. They're not 100%. You would think, at least I would think, that half of that PD, 50%, would be uh, non industrial because 50% 50 of the surgery was required by the uh, non industrial condition. But I would be wrong, and you would be wrong if you follow that logic. You know, all of it. Um, is, is on, and all of that liability is in our lap. High key to you not. Wow, that's a really bad joke. I apologize. If you all hang up now, I'll, I'll totally understand. You may ask, these are just arguments as to why I think this is wrong. Um, among other things, um, I believe this could, uh, conflicts with the Supreme Court's uh, case of Brody. Uh, so if you should run across a case like this, please let me know. Um, I'd like to t talk to you about it and possibly trying to appeal it up to the California Supreme Court um, because I think I think uh, we could take it quite a way and that the uh, District Court of Appeal is absolutely wrong. So why should we worry about Hakita? Well, our friends at the California Applicants Attorneys Association have already started um, their seminars on how to use Akita. Um, th there was this uh, large seminar here in Monterey their call conventions, which have 1,000 to 2,000 attendees, have, um, have addressed the Hakita. You can expect to see Hakita um, arguments up and down the state of California. How much, how, what type of situations will this um, apply to? Cases of adverse medication reactions? I think so. What about internal scarring, weight gain, HPT, high, high blood pressure? I think these will apply, it will, it will apply to these as well. Cases where surgical infections and other surgical complications lead to dire circumstances. Yes, I think this will apply too. All right, let's get to um, a better case. Uh, City of Jackson, this is the genetics case that we talked about earlier, but I wanted to get uh, more information to you. This is the third district court of appeal. We had a police officer who had cervical pain and as a result had surgery. The QME said 17% of this is due to the job, uh, job, job A. 17% is due to, to work on job B. 17% is due to prior activities, and 49% of it is due to genetics. Dr. Blair said, to a, reasonable degree medical, to a reasonable degree of medical probability, that's our magic words again, the genetics has played a role in Mr. Rice's injury, even though that you can't test for genetic factors. And we're not allowed to legally test for genetic factors, but the doctor said, I've got medical literature that, uh, that uh, helps support this, this uh, observation. The medical study says heritability um, is 73% of the cervical spine, is 73% in the cervical spine. Smoking, age, and work are only a small percentage of this disease, and most of it is familial. That is, most of it is from mama and daddy, grandma and grandpa. He found a second study that said inheritability of disc degeneration makes up 90, 75% of DDD. A third study said 73%. A fourth study pointed out that there were twin studies demonstrate degeneration in adults may be explained by up to 75% of genes alone. A fourth study said environmental factors have little to, that is work, little to not at all impact on disc problems. So giving applicant every benefit of the doubt 
the doctor apportioned 49% away, um, saying that that was the lowest amount, or lowest level that could be reasonably stated. The WCAB said, that's not substantial evidence. This is genetics. It's uh, immutable. They said, apportionment genetics resulted in an allocation of disability to an impermissible immutable factor. It's just not fair, really seemed to be the underlying argument from the WCAB. The Court of Appeal said, are you kidding me? The argument is not whether it's fair or not fair. Fair is not a test. The test is whether or not the doctor is, to a reasonable medical probability, able to give substantial evidence that uh, there is apportionment to, quote unquote, other factors. And that's exactly what happened. And there is case law elsewhere that says all other factors include DDD. And remember our asymptomatic prior conditions and the Escobedo decision, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Genetics don't differ in any way, shape, or form from these other factors. Don't talk about fairness. Talk about factors that contributed to and helped cause the level of permanent disability. Then we will apportion those out. Quote, we perceive no relevant distinction between allowing apportionment based on a pre-existing congenital or pathological condition and allowing apportionment based on a pre-existing degenerative condition caused by heredity or, and or genetics. Using medical literature is very helpful and you might want to do it for your doctor. The QME's decision was supported by significant, unrebutted medical treatment, literature rather, that found DDD was influenced by genetic factors and only minimally uh, to environmental factors such as work. Doing the research for your doctor may take you a long way. We at Bradford and Barthel have spared no cost, um, no money when looking for uh, ways for our attorneys to research medical issues, uh, whether it's to prepare for a letter to the doctor or to prepare for a doctor's deposition. And if you don't have these tools, I strongly recommend you get them, if not at work at home. It's called Google. Uh, I, I only I have my tongue in, my tongue in cheek, but I'm absolutely serious. I don't take a doctor's deposition. I don't send a letter to a doctor at this point without taking a look at the available medical literature on Google. You can get a wealth of information about virtually you know about any uh, medical condition, including these studies that the doctor um, in the case that we just talked about cited. Upshot: Google before you depose. And let's get a little crazy check out the volumes of research that are confirming that conditions are from medical conditions can be caused by genetics, historical factors, and environmental factors. Unhappy with the apportionment determination? What should your plan of attack be? Do nothing. Maybe your doc will find to be the most substantial evidence in the room and you'll win on that. Two, obtain a supplemental, a supplemental report to bolster your apportionment determination or to and or to oppose the doctor's percentage important apportionment determination. Three, take the doctor's deposition. But remember, it's not substantial evidence if the doctor relies on facts no longer germane, on an inadequate medical history, on the any inadequate medical his, medical exam, and incorrect legal theories. As I suggested earlier, Escobedo was probably miscited about 20% of the time. Surmise, speculation, conjecture, or guess also renders the report not substantial evidence, or at least the factor that the doctor is speculating, guessing, or conjecturing about. Uh, this is why we ask when the doctor says something in deposition or provides us information in a report, we ask doctor, is this true to a medical, reasonable medical probability? And hopefully, if it's information that we want to confirm, the doctor states that it is, it is true to a reasonable medical probability. We have to avoid mere conclusions. If you've ever seen a doctor's deposition transcript, you'll see that the admonitions include that we don't want the doctor to guess. Actually, that, that's true of also of applicant's deposition transcripts. We want the applicant or the, and or the doctor to avoid guessing because that's not evidence. That's mere conjecture, and it's not something we can hang our um, hat on. What if the doctor's explanation is not adequate? The, the, the court may allow the parties to obtain a supplemental, and there's case law to that effect. What if no one has substantial apportionment evidence? 
Uh, WCAB or the judge also may require further development of the record. There's case law in, in, on, to that effect, the Peeney case. For example, there was a report, they had a report that had contradictory information regarding apportionment. The report did not explain the contradiction, and it was ordered that if there would be a further development of the record. However, don't rely on that. Remember that the apportionment is a defense, is a defense um, argument. It's an affirmative defense, meaning it is on us, the defendants, to come up with the information that supports the apportionment. Uh, it's a very generous judge indeed who allows the matter to go off calendar um, so that the defense can save itself by obtaining apportionment information. I think the likelihood, the likelihood is low that most judges will let the thing go off calendar simply to um, get further, to further develop the record on an apportionment issue. So here's a Jaeger, the Jaeger decision, and here's a illustration of a of a, of a spine of what a normal disc looks like. This is what my disc looks like because I'm 57 years old. Here's a bulge. You hear about bulging of discs. This is you think of the the disc as a jelly donut. You may have heard that the jelly bean inside, and sometimes there's a hole in that jelly donut, and uh, it, the jelly sticks on out. And well. It may be asymptomatic, and the AMA guides provide no impairment for a herniated disc with, that is asymptomatic. It may also impinge on a new nerve root, and that's called radiculopathy. That is the pain, numbness, numbness tingling, uh, pin-like feeling uh, going up, or up the uh, arm or, or down the leg. Uh, in, those, in that situation, the uh, um, AMA guides do provide impairment. And I think that's the number one type of surgery we see um, out there in workers' compensation is the discectomy, which is the removal of this um, the jelly so that it no longer uh, no longer impacts the the uh, the uh, the nerve running up or down. Here's thinning um, thinning of the disc, and I thought I had a picture of a compression fracture, but I do not. Anyway. We've got, we've got the uh, Jaeger decision. There was a back injury. Ten years prior, this person had occasional minimal back pain. Now, for those of you who remember the 1997 permanent disability rating schedule, occasional minimal back pain was, was unrateable. It was a big zero. Ten years prior, this individual had been to the chiropractor two, maybe three times, couldn't remember. Nevertheless, the doctor apportioned 20% to DDD, degenerative disc disease. And the doctor said, what's DDD? It's like a wear and tear phenomenon. It's, it's getting older. Again, the older you get, the more wear and tear you get. It's just a, it's just a fundamental fact of life. And the doctor had con confirmed this by way of an MRI. It was held that by the WCJ and the WCAB that this was not substantial evidence. The Court of Appeal, happily somebody had decided to appeal, reversed. And they reminded us, again, what we need is substantial evidence, framed in terms of, there's our magic words, reasonable medical probability, based on the facts, exam, history, with reasoning, going all the way back to Escobedo and Dr. Elvadia, with the reasoning provided for the conclusion. The doctor did the trick and met all these requirements. He used the reasoning medical probability language. He relied on the MRI and the prior history of the occasional minimal um, back problems. And it was reminded, the, the court reminded us that the doctor doesn't have to be perfect. There's not a MRI type machine that we can stick the human body in and it can tell us, oh, 27% of this is due to a non-industrial injury, 62% is due to uh, et cetera, et cetera. That, that's not the way it works. The doctor has to provide us their best um, estimated, their best estimation, not guesstimation, but their approximate percentage. Remember, Labor Code Section 43, 4663, the approximate percentage of the, the PD that's industrial and the approximate percentage that's non industrial. In the the uh, DCA said here the 20% figure that the IME, independent medical examiner, used is based on its subjective evaluation. Our friends at Call for the longest time said, well, wait a minute, apportionment is based on a subjective evaluation. It can't possibly be good law. But yes, it can. It can because it just can't be a guess. 
We cannot conclude that it's merely a random number. The doctor explained that apportionment would have been greater if the applicant had received greater or more extensive treatment. So the doctor, again, like Dr. Ovadi and Escobedo, provided an explanation as to how he'd come up with this 20% figure, and that was considered sufficient according to the District Court of Appeal. Jaeger is no DDD fluke. It would be incorrect to conclude that in degenerative disease cases, the applicant's permanent disability is necessarily entirely directly caused by the industrial injury with no possible apportionment to non-industrial causation. If the injury was caused, if the injury was the straw, the injury was the straw that broke the camel's back, if, but for the industrial injury, it was not clear when or if the degenerative condition would have progressed or to cause disability, or if the degenerative, degenerative condition was asymptomatic or largely asymptomatic before the injury occurred. Let's read this all one more time because I think it's worth considering. It would be incorrect to conclude that in these GDD cases, an applicant's PD is necessarily entirely directly caused by the industrial injury. That is, in EDD, DDD cases, it's wrong to assume that all the PD is AOE, COE, with no possible apportionment to non-industrial uh, non causation. If one, the injury was the straw that broke the camel's back, that's okay. It two, if but for the industrial injury, it is not clear when or if the degenerative condition would have progressed to cause disability, that's okay. We can apportion there. Or three. If the degenerative condition was asymptomatic or largely asymptomatic before the industrial injury, that's okay too. Apportionment is allowable in that scenario. The fact that the applicant might not now have disability but for her industrial injury is no longer the proper test. The relevant question is what percentage of the current disability is directly caused by the industrial factors and what percentage is caused by other factors? In this particular language, they're pretty much uh, rephrasing Labor Code Section 4663. What do uh, apportionment and petitions for re, uh, petitions to reopen have to do with one another? Well, remember, five years post injury, the applicant may up to five years post injury, the applicant may claim new and further and want to get more permanent disability. Um, according to the, the Vargas decision, the the ability to provide to obtain apportionment. Um, applies to that subsequent um, um, the, the, to the to the subsequent claim of new and further. In this particular case, the original award was 67% without apportionment. There was a petition to reopen before the FNA issued. SB 899 went into effect, so the judge reopened the record for evidence regarding apportionment, and the WCA WCAB agreed. They said the new apportionment rules apply to increase in PD in any petition to reopening as of April 19, 2004. And new apportionment law can't be used to re but, but the new apportionment law can't be used to recalculate the original award or order in terms of PD amount of apportionment or to the extent there will be an increased PD. So, in other words, there's a prior award of PD prior to April 19, 2004. We're stuck with that. And let's say it was a 50 percent. Permit disability award, stipulated award, for example, it's 50%. We can't um, revisit that one. However, effective April 19th of 2004, on if there is a petition to reopen, we can seek apportionment for that additional permanent disability, if any. Um, this parent's uh, decision merely, merely stands for the proposition that doctors should not say, Oh, I'm not going to make the uh, apportionment determination. I'm going to um, I'm going to just adopt the apportionment determination made by another doctor um, because we need to know the how and why that the that the that the doctor has come up with this apportionment determination. Also, it spreads sort of spreads your uh, your risk uh, across doctors. So have all your doctors make different make their own determinations and explain the how and why. Rubio decision, fact, we had a prior award of 11% to the upper back. This is returning to Labor Code Section 4664. Had a second injury um, to the left shoulder. The judge awarded 15% PD with no apportionment, and the WCAB agreed. Why? Well, this is Labor Code Section 4664. It provides that the applicant received a prior award of permanent disability, 
they are they did not rehabilitate themselves, and we can subtract that subsequent permanent disability from the um, subsequent prior subsequent permanent disability from the prior permanent disability award. But in this particular case, there had been no evidence that the applicant had actually received an 11% PD award in the earlier case, and um, there was also no evidence that there had been any overlap. The it's in, it's essential that we prove overlap to obtain apportionment under Labor Code Section 4664. So, can 4664 apportionment really work in up in um, workers' compensation? Well, in this case, we had an 18, 1987 right injury with a 50% work restriction between very heavy work and semi sedentary work. The medical reports uh, confirm this split, and there was a stipulation of 50% to the right knee. The 1987 right knee is 50%. Then there was a, um, a left knee in 2005, sedentary work of 70%. The WCJ said that's 100%. We've got a 50% award. A 70% award, that must be 100%, right? Wrong. We get apportionment. 50%. Can you imagine, can you figure out how we got the 50%? Well, the prior award was, the, the, the current award is 100%. They had a prior award of 50%. We have evidence of that award, and we can demonstrate overlap of the knees. So we get to subtract that out on Labor Code Section 4664. But can you subtract, but the this case, utilize the permit disability, the 1997 permit disability rating schedule. What if you have a prior award um, utilizing the 1997 schedule and the new uh, case is used as the 2005 PDRS and AMA, AMA guide, can we subtract apples from oranges and if so, how? Well, we've got a decision that helped us with that. There, in this particular case, we had a 92 back injury rated under the 1997 permanent disability rating schedule. There was a 2004 injury rated under the AMA guide. It was held that there was no inner overlap because the injuries were rated using different schedules, and that's true, but all was determined not to be lost. The WCIB remanded it down to the judge to find out if that 92 injury could be evaluated using the AMA guide, and if they, it could be, then we could then we could scratch then we could um, subtract that out and um, that um, and obtain a portion under 4664. The AME was asked to describe the PD for or each injury used in the AME guide. He did that, and we had the 2004 injury, the 2005 injury was the, that we were allowed to subtract out. Also, in addition to subtracting out under 4664, and 4664 is the much more difficult manner of apportioning, the doctor said, well, under 4663, the quote-unquote approximate percentage of non-industrial factor contribution to the PD is 20%. That makes it just a heck of a lot easier. So we can apportion for 4663 and 4664 at the same time. Let's see here, how are we doing on time? Well, we've got a few more minutes. Let's do the VIRA decision. In this particular case, we had a 73-year-old woman who bent over to pick up some brochures. Not a box of your brochures, not a case of brochures, some pieces of paper. She suffered a compression fracture. This is a big deal. Um, normally when somebody tells you they um, have a compression fracture, you ask how many stories they fell or how large the truck was that ran them over. The AME found 64% PD, and apportioned 40% to age and pre-existing osteoporosis. In his deposition, he said, with regards to causation and apportionment, it is my opinion that the applicant certainly does have risk secondary to aging process and pre-existing osteopenia or osteoporosis. These two conditions lumped together would be responsible for 40% of her current disability. Uh-oh, I'm confused. It appears that the doctor is apportioning to age. We can't apportion to age. Age, it's, um, age is a discrimination, just like um, race, religion, gender. We're not allowed to discriminate against people because of their age. So which two conditions is the doctor referring to? Is he referring to aging one and osteopenia, osteoporosis as another, or is, which is a problem? Or is he referring to osteopenia um, as one and osteoporosis as the other? That's less of a problem. In the deposition, he also said, for the age predisposed her to the injury, the osteoporosis, and possibly other factors, he put this together, and she was pretty significant, pretty significantly at risk. So 
the question was, is this legal apportionment or is this mere discrimination on the basis of age? The answer was maybe and maybe not. Don't you love those answers spoken from a, definitely the words that, of a, a, that come out of the mouth of an attorney? To the extent that the AME based his apportionment on age, this violates the code. Um, the WCIB may not reduce a petitioner's PD just because he or she is older or male or female or straight or gay or Lutheran, et cetera, et cetera. However, to the extent that the osteoporosis or some other condition that might contribute to the work-related disability arises or becomes more acute with age, we see no problem with apportioning PD to that condition. No problem whatsoever. Thus, in such cases, apportionment is not to age, but it is to the disability, age disability, disabling condition. So in, in this particular situation, you would ask the doctor, okay, I understand that she has age-related conditions of osteoporosis, and that osteoporosis that you are apportioning to. And she's 72 years old, and it's likely that she has the osteoporosis because of her age. But if she were 22, and she had, had the same level of osteoporosis, would you be apportioning the same amount of permanent disability to that pre-existing osteoporosis? If the answer is yes, we're, we're okay. What if this causes a disparate impact? And it's going to. What's a disparate impact? This looks like a disparate impact, but it's not that, that, not that kind of impact. The disparate impact is this. If, for example, we are apportioned to osteoporosis, and we find that that is something that's um, largely only found in older people, you're going to find more people who are older suffering from apportionment or being apport having their permanent disability apportioned away than while younger people. So that sounds like that may be discriminatory against older people, but it's not. And that's what the District Court of Appeals said. They said reducing PD based on a pre-existing condition that is a contributing factor of disability is not discrimination. When the WCIB determines a pre-existing condition contributes to a given disability and apportions accordingly, this is merely a recognition that a portion of the disability exists independent of the industrial, industrial injury. The doctors provide the approximate percentage of permanent disability that's work-related and the approximate percentage that, in this case, is due to the, the age-related osteopenia, but non-industrial. The dirty little secret, such apportionment is not discrimination. So lesson, make sure the doctor uses the correct language. Ages to, when you say he or she ages to apportionment, say no. Apportions to an age-related condition, that's fine, not a problem. All right, we managed to get through with four minutes to spare. I wanna invite you, if you have any questions, to please uh, email them to, to Tammy, and she will provide them to me. To, to me. But in the meantime, let me put uh, her back on. I wanna wish you all a wonderful day and a wonderful weekend because it's coming up fast. Thanks a lot. Here's Tammy.